By April of 56 BC, not only was the triumvirate between Caesar, Pompeius and Crassus stretched to its breaking point, but Pompeius Magnus' popularity had plummeted to an all-time low. Following the death of Sulla, many of the conservative aristocratic families were willing to attach their fortunes to Pompeius, helping him to secure and maintain their own ascendancy over Roman politics. This was because Sulla had connected Pompeius to the aristocracy through the marriage of his stepdaughter, Aemilia Scora, the daughter of Rome's then princeps senatus, Marcus Aemilia Scorus. When Aemilia died in childbirth, Sulla, through another marriage, attached Pompeius to the family he, himself had married into, the Metelli. Pompeius's third wife, Musia Tertia, was the half-sister of Metellus Nepos and Metellus Sella. And whomever the Metelli supported, much of Rome's aristocracy followed. This support from the aristocracy allowed Pompeius to extort extraordinary proconsular powers from the Senate during the rebellion of 77 BC, led by Marcus Aemilius Lepidus and Marcus Junius Brutus, and further allowed Pompeius to use that proconsular command in Hispania against Quintus Sertorius. But, when Pompeius returned to Italy in time to claim the laurels of victory which should have belonged to Marcus Licinius Crassus, another from the camp of Sulla, conservatives began to split, with some questioning Pompeius's long-term ambitions. When, in 67 BC, Pompeius's tribune of the plebs, Aulus Gabinius, began legislating the Lex Gabinia, a special command which placed formerly unheard of powers into the hands of one man, more aristocrats began questioning Pompeius's aims. Quintus Hortensius, a former Sulla supporter, content to support Pompeius, found himself opposing the Lex Gabinia alongside Catulus, the supporter of Sulla who had granted Pompeius his special command against Lepidus. By 63 BC, given the events surrounding the conspiracy of Catalina, and the authoritarian response from Cicero, Marcus Porcius Cato emerged as the voice of the ultra-conservative faction known as the Boni. While still in the East, Pompeius had slyly used his brother-in-law, Metellus Nepos, to recall himself from the East and give himself control over the city of Rome. But Cato led the fight against Nepos, a fight which culminated in the physical and illegal restraint of Nepos when Cato's ally clapped his hands over Nepos's mouth, refusing to let him speak. The bill to recall Pompeius to Rome and put him in charge of the city following the events of the Catalina conspiracy, however, was a piece of political theatre designed to give Pompeius the power he needed to easily ratify his conquest of the East, and to settle his many legions. When Nepos's attempt to pass the bill failed, Pompeius predicted Cato would emerge as the head of the new conservative party, and fight the legislation every step of the way, by aligning himself with Lucullus. It was at this time that a rumour suddenly emerged of an affair between Pompeius's wife, Musia Tertia, and Caesar, who had actually supported Nepos in the recall of Pompeius. And so, based upon this rumour, Pompeius took a calculated risk and divorced his wife of 18 years, offering himself and his eldest son to two of Cato's nieces in a marriage alliance with Cato. Unfortunately for Pompeius, Cato made it abundantly clear that his allegiance could not be secured by means of a woman's boudoir. By divorcing Musia, the half-sister of both Metellus Nepos and Metellus Sella, Pompeius quickly lost their support. He had already lost the support of Metellus Creticus, and those within his circle, by attempting to seize credit for the conquest of Crete, and vehemently opposing the Senate's move to grant Creticus a triumph. The aristocratic Metelli, a family so powerful that even Sulla realized his success hinged on their endorsement, now abandoned Pompeius Magnus. They were outraged at the man who saw fit to label their faultless half-sister an adulteress for the sake of a political alliance. Running low on popular backing, Pompeius, by 60 BC, had little to lose and everything to gain through an alliance with Caesar and Crassus. Everything he had done, from using Nepos to take control of Rome, to divorcing Musia Tertia, had been done in pursuit of ratifying his conquest of the East, and owing to his need to settle approximately 120,000 soldiers who, if not properly rewarded, could become a very real threat to the safety of Rome's republic. By aligning himself with Caesar and Crassus, Pompeius could now anticipate the settling of his legions, which thus far Crassus had fought. 
In exchange for his ratifications, Pompeius was obligated to support Caesar's attempt to pass agrarian legislation which had been on the table for almost 70 years, usually ending in the deaths of those supporting what was deemed the redistribution of wealth. But Caesar had pulled a fast one. He had strong-armed the Senate into enacting his laws, intertwined with the ratifications of Pompeius's eastern campaigns, forcing Pompeius to support Caesar, even in the face of the Senate's disapproval. Then, after exempting Campania from his agrarian land bill, Caesar turned around and removed Campania's exemption. By legislating the land in Campania be dedicated for a good portion of Pompeius's legions, Caesar put Pompeius in a bad position. In order to keep the loyalty of his legions, Pompeius was forced to outright oppose the Senate. This opposition to the Senate resulted in Pompeius's inability to raise a finger to help Cicero as the birds of prey circled ever closer. And once Cicero was gone, Clodius, the instrument of his exile, turned his ire against Pompeius, forcing the general to cower in his own home. But, the antics of Clodius, increasingly more violent and outrageous, caused many within the Senate to throw their weight behind the exiled orator. Sensing an opportunity, however slight, to work in common cause with the Senate again, Pompeius began the provincial canvassing which ended in the lifting of Cicero's exile. During that same year, however, a grain shortage threatened famine in the city of Rome, and members of the Senate received death threats from a panicked population. At the same time, Ptolemy Auletes and his daughter, Cleopatra, had come to Rome seeking the Senate's aid in restoring his throne. Pompeius wanted command of the army that would reinstall Ptolemy Auletes, but he didn't dare ask for it. In his efforts to recall Cicero, Pompeius had made progress in repairing his relationship with the Senate, and was afraid to stymie it by requesting yet another military command. So, while he made noise about solving the grain issue, he manipulated all those senators who had loaned money to Ptolemy Auletes, and who could only get their money back if Ptolemy remained king of Egypt, into doing battle on his behalf within the Senate. Even Cicero was meant to help, but Pompeius had remained so vague about his interests that Cicero, writing to a friend after having dinner with Pompeius one evening, said he was convinced that Pompeius didn't want the Egyptian campaign, and so supported Pompeius to oversee the grain shortage. But, in his power play to get command of the campaign against Egypt, Pompeius realized that it was one of the triumvirs, Marcus Licinius Crassus who was actively campaigning against him through the agency of Publius Clodius. In April of 56 BC, when he left for Sardinia, in search of grain distributors, Pompeius Magnus's popularity and reputation had plunged. Caesar had legally outmaneuvered him, and Crassus was deliberately working against him. And so, on his way to catch a ship to Sardinia, Pompeius made a stop at the town of Lucca, where Caesar had chosen to spend the 57-56 BC winter. Through crafty legislation, Pompeius found himself undeniably attached to Caesar, but he was not without options. Lucius Domitius Enobarbus was running for the 55 BC consulship on promises to take over the campaign in Gaul himself, and call Caesar back to Rome to stand trial for his crimes. And though most of the Senate's anger was directed at Pompeius, Cicero had demonstrated just how ready the Senate was to bring Caesar down as well. In hopes of reconciling Pompeius to the Senate, Cicero had opened a discussion about the Campanian land bill, which invited the Senate to vent its spleen against Caesar, an invitation it relished. Finally, it was Caesar who needed Pompeius if he hoped to retain his command and escape prosecution in Rome. Pompeius, in concert with Crassus, could beat Enobarbus for the 55 BC consulship. As consuls, Pompeius and Crassus would not only have the power to stop Caesar's recall to Rome, but they could even pass legislation which would lengthen Caesar's already five-year proconsular term in Gaul. But, after all the abuse and political manipulation he had endured at the hands of Caesar and Crassus, it was now Pompeius's support that came at a price if Caesar was willing to pay it.